that the gospel of God confronts us in our weakness and calls us to turn from idols to worship the living God. This morning we are in Acts chapter 14, verse 8, down through verse 18. This morning we're going to observe three ways in which these Gentiles interacted with the gospel. Three ways in which the Gentiles in this text interacted with the gospel. You remember that in previous chapters... The Apostle Paul and Barnabas had set out on the Apostle Paul's first missionary journey, one of three that we have record of. And on this first missionary journey, they left from Antioch in Syria, north of Jerusalem quite some ways. And they leave Antioch, Syria. They go out into the Mediterranean Sea. They, they canvass the island of Cyprus, leading many people to faith in Jesus as they, you, Angelizo, or they preach the gospel. And they preach there in the island of Cyprus. They leave Cyprus and they go north to the region of Galatia or to modern day Turkey as we know it. And they go up to Antioch in Pisidia. There they lead many people to Christ. And just as in every city that they preach Jesus, they, while they experience great evangelistic success, what do they also experience? Opposition. In every city that they go, there, there's a battle for the souls of, of men and women, for people whom, whom Jesus died for. And so Paul and Barnabas, they preach the gospel and they endure much conflict and much persecution. They leave Antioch in Pisidia after uh, much persecution breaks out and they flee to a place called Iconium. That was about 90 miles to the east of Antioch in Pisidia. When they come to Iconium, again, they preach the gospel, they lead many people to Jesus, but what do they also incur? Great opposition in every city. It's the same exact formula. Success in preaching the gospel, opposition coming from the devil. And so in Iconium, it tells us that there were leaders of the city, there were Jewish leaders of the city who stirred up the Gentile believers, and it says that they, they poisoned their minds against the brothers. And so Paul and Barnabas, what do you think their reaction would be? There's trouble brewing there in the church in Iconium. They're poisoning the minds against Paul and Barnabas. What do Paul and Barnabas do? They don't, they don't hit the streets and, and run. They actually stay. They stay for a long time because they are going to fight for those for whom Christ died. It's worth it to fight for people whom God loves. It's worth it for us to fight for people who come to know Jesus. And that's what Paul and Barnabas do. And so I asked you the question, how are you fighting for people that have come to know Jesus? How are you fighting for them? How are you fighting for their faith? Are you encouraging them on a daily basis? Are you coming up alongside, especially those who are new to faith in Christ? Are you, are you building them up? Or are we letting Satan, are we letting the enemy, are we letting opposition come and, and stir up division and stir up strife and, and poison our minds against the brothers and sisters? Paul and Barnabas stay there in Iconium and they fight that. Then after some time, uh, word comes to them that persecution was not enough to drive them away. So there is a mob that has gathered together and they intend not to persecute Paul and Barnabas. They intend to murder them. So Paul and Barnabas hear of this. They have many more sermons that they must preach. And so they flee Iconium and they go down just about 15 or 20 miles or so to the south of Iconium to a city called Lystra. Then they leave Lystra and they go to Derby. All of this is on their way back. They essentially made a big loop and they're on their way back to Antioch in Syria and then eventually to Jerusalem to give word of what they've done, preaching the gospel. So we get in verse 8 through 18 a bit of a bird's eye view of what happened there in the city of Lystra, a Gentile city. We're not even sure if there was even a Jewish synagogue in Lystra. In every city it's seen that Paul and Barnabas went to, there was a Jewish synagogue because they went there first. But when you read verse 8 through 18, you don't see them going to a Jewish synagogue, which tells me that there probably wasn't one and maybe... Maybe that's the reason Paul and Barnabas went to Lystra in the first place. 
They thought that they could go to Lystra and they could avoid conflict for just a period of time because there's no synagogue of the Jews. Um, but lo and behold, they'll encounter a type of conflict of a, another type, it seems. What you're going to see arise from this text is this truth. And I want you to write this down. The guys will put this up on the board. I want you to write this down and understand this truth. That the gospel of God confronts us in our weakness and calls us to turn from idols to worship the living God. I'll explain that for, for just a moment and then we'll let the text explain it. The gospel of God calls us in our weakness, confronts us in our weakness. You know, the gospel of God does not normally, I don't, I don't know of ever if I read anything in Scripture uh, of it ever occurring where the gospel of God confronts a person in their strength. You know, the Bible tells us that God is far from the haughty. It says that he sees the haughty from afar, the arrogant, those who are puffed up, high-handedness. He sees them from afar, but where is he in regard to the lowly? He's very near to them. God goes to the lowly because when, when you come to a place where you are lowly, where you are humbled, where you recognize your insufficiencies and your weaknesses, guess what you are ready to do? You are ready to faith. You're ready to faith as a verb there. Faith is the only action you can take in this life where you are putting 100% dependency on God. That's what faith is. And you can only exhibit faith when you have come to the end of believing in your own sufficiency. So a person says, you know what, I have tried to do the right thing, I've tried to do the good things, but I continually do the bad things. Why do I do the bad things? Do I do the bad things because I messed up? No, I don't, I don't do the bad things because I, I messed up. I do the bad things because I messed up. I, I'm at the end here. I, I can't make myself right before God by doing good deeds. Because for every good deed that I do, I do too bad. I, I never outweigh the scale here anyway. I just can't do the right thing. God, I'm at the end of my rope. I can't make my way to you. Oh, Lord, would you just forgive me? What does that person just do? They just put their faith in God. They say, God, I can't depend on myself. God, I depend on you. God, I can't bring healing to myself. God, I'm going to depend on you. God, I can't fix this situation. God, I'm going to depend on you. Faith comes when you quit depending on yourself and you wholeheartedly, 100%, put your dependency in the hands of God. So then, God confronts us in our weakness. And when he confronts us in our weakness, what does he do? He calls us to turn from something and to someone. He calls us to turn from idols. What is an idol? An idol is anything or anyone that you attribute the good gifts of God to that is not actually God. Or you attribute your salvation or your help to this person or to these things. For instance, this is common amongst, amongst men and women, is the idol of money. You can look at money as an idol. When you look at money and say, if I only have a little bit more money, my life would be fixed, my problems would be done away with, everything would be right, and it would be grand and okay. What have you done? You've turned money into the thing that you put all of your dependency on. So everything you do, the choices you make, the way you do your work, the way you interact with people, it's all governed by what money requires, not what God requires. So therefore, money has become an idol. There are many good things that can become an idol. Your spouse can become an idol. Your children can become an idol. Oh, if my, if my children ever just arrive at that perfect place, my life would be good, our life would be right, everything would be fixed. That doesn't fix the problem of being sinful. 
It doesn't fix the problem of needing to have my sins washed away before God. I can have everything right at home with my spouse, with my kids, with my money, and I still be rotten and messed up before God. Now, is money a bad thing? No, you ought to work hard. You ought to do what you can to be as solvent as you possibly can. Find a way to be honestly wealthy so you can serve more people. Why does God bless you? So you can bless other people. Making money is not a bad thing. Making a lot of money is not a bad thing. In fact, having, having a godly, good, awesome spouse is a wonderful thing. It's not a bad thing. Having great and wonderful kids is not a, a bad thing. That is a good thing. I've said this to you before. When good things become God things, they have become bad things. So God comes to us in our weaknesses, and he calls us to turn from those things that cannot save us. But the, the Christian religion following Christ is not just a bunch of, a bunch of no-nos. It's God telling us, turn from the things that can't give you life. Now turn to who? The living God. Turn to the living God, the one who can wash away your sins, the one who can give you eternal life, the one who can be sufficient and will be sufficient for all of your needs. That's what the gospel does when it comes to people. It comes to people in their weakness, calls them to turn from their idols, and calls them to worship the living God. And that's what you see happen here in Lystra as Paul and Barnabas come. So let's look at our text and see what plays out here in this event. Three things, three ways ways that the Gentiles interact with the gospel. Verse 8 says, Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. When you look at verse 8 and you start thinking back on what we have studied and what you have read in the book of Acts, what you remember is that this, this uh, incident is almost identical to the incident that took place in Acts chapter 3 when Peter, the apostle Peter, and John are going up to the temple there in Jerusalem at the hour of prayer. And as they go up, they see a man who is what? Crippled from his mother's womb. That's the same exact phrase. There are a number of identical phrases that Luke uses here. This is almost the same exact event, and yet the event that took place with Peter and John was amongst the Jews. It was there in Jerusalem. Now the same exact event is taking place far away from Jerusalem, and it's not Peter and John. Now it is Paul and Barnabas. So look at this man. He was sitting. He could not use his feet, and he was crippled from birth had never walked. Can you imagine the humiliating degradation that this man must have experienced in his lifetime? He knew nothing but dependency all of his life. The Bible doesn't say that he had, he had been walking, had some terrible accident, and lost his ability to move. It says that he was literally lame from his mother's womb, crippled from his mother's womb. In Acts chapter 3, it tells us that this, this man there was a, that was in Jerusalem being a cripple from birth, he was actually carried everywhere that he went. And they would carry him up to the temple at the hour of prayer. I imagine this man in Lystra had been carried to there at the marketplace in Lystra. Maybe he had been carried at certain times to the temple at Zeus right there outside the city so that he could encounter the most populous places at the most opportune times so that his begging uh, entrepreneurial spirit would be most prosperous. So he's right there in the midst of all of these people. And guess what? All of these people in Lystra who had passed this man on a daily basis, they could all validate that this man truly was crippled. They look at his legs. They see them shriveled up. He has no strength. He's never walked. This man has lived a humiliating life. Look at verse 9. He listened to Paul speaking. When Paul's speaking, what is Paul speaking about? He's telling them about Jesus. Jesus has come to be the, the God of the Jews and the God of the Gentiles. Jesus dies for sinners. And if sinners will call out in faith to Jesus to forgive them of their sins, he does that and he gives them everlasting life. So he listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him, you know, that is the same exact, it's another one of these identical phrases. That's the same exact phrase used there in Acts chapter 3, verse 4. As Peter and John go up those steps to the temple, it says that they looked intently. Peter gazed intently at that crippled man. It says that the word there is atenesos. It's not just a passing glance. He looked right at him. 
See, the Apostle Paul was not just glancing over the crowd, avoiding eye contact with anybody, and especially that crippled guy over there, because he's probably not going to give much money in the offering plate. That's not the way Paul preached. Paul is looking intently at the people that he's preaching to, and especially, especially the person who is broken. Paul doesn't look down on this man. Paul's going to look to this man to help him is what he's going to do. Looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. Verse 8 through 10, you see God's power confront this man in his weakness. As Paul looked at this man, it says what? He saw that he had faith to be made well. Now, the, the English translation doesn't necessarily do this word very much justice, to, to be made well, faith to be made well. That word to be made well is actually the word sadzo. It's a cognate of that word, sadzo. It's where we get our term soteriology or the, the doctrine of salvation, the study of salvation. So when it says that he saw that this man had faith to be made well, what is it saying? saying that he, he had some sort of faith that is powerful unto salvation. Is that salvation of his body? I, I believe that it is. But what happens here at first? What happens here first is that this man is listening intently to Paul. He's watching him, he's listening, and he believes. He has faith. Not just that he can be healed, he has faith in what Paul is preaching. What you see here is you see two healings take place, don't you? You see that this man first, he listens to the words of the Apostle Paul and he believes. He has faith. The first healing that takes place here is not the healing of this man's broken body. The first healing that takes place here is the healing of this man's soul. This man sees in his own person his inability to help himself. He hears the words of Paul saying that Jesus is to be Lord over your life, and he says yes to Jesus. And so this man is saved. He has the kind of faith that saves him, which is the same kind of faith by which you can be made well. And so the secondary healing comes along, and the apostle Paul looks at him, and what does he say? Stand upright on your feet. You say, well, thank you, Paul, for telling me something I know that I can't do. In all of my life, maybe he's 30, maybe he's 50 years old. The Bible doesn't tell us. It tells us he's a grown man. Regardless, all of his life, he has never walked. He has never stood. It's not that he had at one point been walking and got hurt. This man has never stood before. Paul is commanding this man in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the love of Jesus, he's commanding him to do something that is impossible. And look what God supplies. He said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. That term, he sprang up, that's the same exact phrase, again, that's used in Acts chapter 3, talking about when Peter says to that man at the beautiful gate, the broken man at the beautiful gate, he says, rise up and walk. It says the man leaped up. That word sprang up is actually the word that can also be used to talk about, to talk about a water well when you break ground and finally when you take off that last, that last chunk of mud, that geyser just shoots up. It's, that, that, same, it's that, that kind of imagery here, that this man who had never walked or stood a day in his life at the command of the Lord through his messenger Paul is able to do the impossible. You realize that this crippled man, actually we're not even ever even given his name, are we? He's not the point. This crippled man is made able to do something instantaneously that it takes an infant some nine months to learn. It takes an infant some nine months to learn how to stand. Now, don't come to me after the service and say, my baby walked when they were six months old. It doesn't matter. You're proving the point. At least six months. However perfect your baby is, it took this man instant. He did it faster than your baby, if that makes you feel better. This man stood up instantly. That's astounding, isn't it? He's had no time to, to work his legs out, drink a couple of protein shakes, and get himself strong. He's not had any time to go through physical therapy and to learn the intricacies of how to, to balance a 150-pound, a 200-pound body. He, he doesn't know all these things, but what is he given? 
He's given wholeness of spirit as he believes in the Lord. He's given wholeness of body as he stands. And he's given a wholeness of mind where he's actually able to, to balance himself instantaneously. How is this possible? How is this man able to do the impossible here? Well, friends, when God commands you to do something, he's always going to give you the strength and the ability to do it. When God commands you to do something, he's always going to give you the strength and the ability to do it. So when you read God's word and you read the commands therein and you say, oh, Lord, I, I could never do that. God says, that's okay. I can. I can give you the strength. I can give you the ability we were talking about sinful behaviors there in, in Sunday school and, and how sinful behaviors, don't, they're not just happenstance, they come from who we are. And we look at it and we say, you know what, Lord, I can't do the right thing. I, I can't start being nice. Lord, I just can't love my neighbor because so many people are just unlovely. Lord, I can't do this. When God commands you to do something, he'll give you the strength. He'll give you the ability what do you need to supply? You don't need to supply the strength. You don't need to supply the ability. You must supply the faith. You must have dependency on God. So he says, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. You can imagine the people's reactions at this point. They know this man has been broken all of his life. They can validate this healing. Which brings me to a point that needs to be made. When you see these charlatans, I'll give the goat away there. When you see charlatans on TV who are healing people, they, they slap people with their coats and they fall down and all these sorts of things. Have you ever seen somebody who is legitimately wounded? They may be wounded by the coat slap, but are they legitimately wounded? Are they legitimately diagnosed with, with cancer or with some sort of some illness that can be validated? No, they have a, they have a, spirit, of, a spirit of anxiety, a spirit of depression, and they just, you know, with the wave of, of Benny's jacket, it's gone. My, my comment to, to people on TV that claim to have the healing power of Jesus, my, my challenge to them is to go to Texas Children's Hospital and to walk down the halls. I don't imagine much coat slapping is going to go on or much pushing on people's foreheads. If they can heal somebody in Texas Children's, then they can truly heal somebody. This man's injury, this man's malady was proven. It was validated by these crowds. They knew. That's why they're astonished. That's why their immediate reaction is, this was a work of heaven. This was not a work of earth. Look at verse 11 through 13, because this is, this is where a bit of the meat comes from. What you see is the ignorance of man trying to explain the works of God. The ignorance of man trying to explain the works of God. Verse 11 says, And when the crowds, many crowds, multitudes that is, saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. The ignorance of men trying to explain the works of God. What do you see here in their declaration? When, when they say the gods have come down in the likeness of men. What do you see admitted in their declaration. What, what I see is they are, they are not just implying it. They're just saying. They recognize this is a miracle from heaven. This is not the work of men. These men look like men, but they're doing the work of, of heaven. They're doing the work of they say gods, we say God, and we're right. So they admit that this is a, a heavenly action that takes place, but where are they wrong? They're, they're close, aren't they? The gods have come down to visit us. They are so close, but they're not there. They're so close to understanding that God has visited them, not as Paul and Barnabas, but through Paul and Barnabas. But they're close, but they're so far away. In fact, their admission is idolatrous. 
It's not God honoring. How is their admission here idolatrous when they say Paul and Barnabas, Zeus and Hermes? How, how is their admission idolatrous? It's idolatrous in this, that they see the good graces of God and they attribute them to someone other than Yahweh. They see the good graces of God and they attribute them to someone other than Yahweh, the Lord of heaven and earth, the maker of the heavens and the earth, the father of the only begotten son of God, Jesus Christ. They see the good graces of God and they attribute it to someone other than Yahweh. So they become idolatrous. Now this is incredible what happens here. Let's compare the book of Acts to the gospel accounts real quick. Paul and Barnabas come to Lystra, perform one miracle, and what do the people want to do? Yes, they declare they're gods, but what do they want to do? They want to offer sacrifice to them. They immediately recognize something has happened with deity here, and they want to offer sacrifice. One miracle. This is just man in the flesh, and one miracle, and they want to offer sacrifices. But overlay that with the gospel accounts. With the, gospel, with the gospel accounts, you see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who actually is God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us is what we sang. You see Emmanuel, God with us, come on the scene. And from day one in his ministry, what does he do? Innumerable miracles. Turning water into wine, walking on water, healing people of leprosy, making the lame to walk, casting out demons, giving sight to the blind, healing a man with a withered hand, raising up Lazarus from the dead. Time doesn't permit me to go on here. Miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus performed. And do you ever one time in the Gospels read of somebody wanting to sacrifice to Jesus? No. No. So what's going on here? What's going on here that Paul and Barnabas can do one miracle and immediately people want to call them God? And immediately they want to be, they, people want to sacrifice to them and yet Jesus, God in the flesh, in their midst and they don't see him as God, they don't want to sacrifice to him. In fact, they want to crucify him. What's going on here? This is what's going on here. The same devil, understand this, the same devil that would seek to tempt you to give glory to someone or something other than Jesus is the same devil who would have you malign the name of Jesus. I'll bear this out. The same devil who would tempt you to give glory to someone or something other than Jesus is the same devil who would seek to have you defame the name of Jesus. Here's the truth as I bear that, that principle out for you. Satan would be delighted for all of us to worship. You know, Satan has no problem with people worshiping. Who does, who does Satan have a problem with people worshiping? Jesus. That is it. So he will seek to take your affections, your attentions, and have you attribute the good graces of God to someone other than Jesus. And then when you talk about Jesus, he would have you malign the name of Jesus. Put it like this. When you turn on your TV and you turn on a news station and they have these, uh, these panel debates, we can call them pooled ignorance, but when they have these panel debates and they have all these people up there spewing their nonsense, what do they do when they talk about religion? They talk about all the world's religions. In their eyes, in people who don't love Jesus, in their eyes, every religion in this world is loving and good and gracious and peaceful and wholesome and wonderful. And hey, it would be wonderful if you'd be a Buddhist. It'd be wonderful if you'd be a Muslim. It'd be wonderful if you just worship the God of man and you were an atheistic uh, secularist. They're okay with everything. And then you have this one person they invite in for 15 seconds, and this person says, I'm a Christian. And they said, how dare you? How dare you love Jesus? Who is that? And they malign the name of Jesus. Why? Satan is okay. The devil is okay with people loving Buddha and worshiping a false god all the way to hell. 
Satan is very much so okay with people being devoutly Muslim all the way to hell. He's okay with people being super religious and spiritual. What he is not okay with is people attributing the good graces of God where they truly go to Jesus. That's why these people in their sin, they look at the works of Yahweh and they are tempted by the devil to sacrifice to these men in their midst. You know, Satan would have won a great victory in that day if Paul and Barnabas had let them. If Paul and Barnabas had let them, they would have believed that these men in their midst were their saviors, their salvation, and they would have believed that on their way to hell. Paul and Barnabas know this. That's why they are so distraught in their spirit. Because the same devil that would seek to tempt you to give glory to someone or something other than Jesus is the same devil that would seek to have you malign the name of Jesus. The devil doesn't mind you worshiping anything or anyone other than Jesus. Other than Jesus. Why? Well, because when you worship Jesus, when you place your faith, your dependence on Jesus, what do you get? You don't get what, sa- what Satan wants. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But in Jesus, you get life. You get life everlasting. You get all these good things that we were talking about as we worshiped. All these good gifts of God in Christ Jesus. So they want to sacrifice. That's an interesting thought too, isn't it? As soon as the people of Lystra, these pagan, heathen, Gentile barbarians, as soon as they believe that they have an audience with deity, what do they want to do? Do you see it right there in the text? What is the first thing they want to do? They want to sacrifice. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? That even the pagan, as soon as they feel like they have an audience with a deity, they want to sacrifice. They want to atone for their sin. They know that something is wrong. If we've got an audience with the gods, we want to make it right because something is wrong with humanity. Something is wrong with our city. Something is wrong with us. We want to make things right. They are seeking reconciliation, but they are seeking it in the wrong place. There are people that seek reconciliation through the Catholic Church by doing good deeds as though their good deeds could outweigh their bad deeds. They know there is something wrong, but they seek reconciliation in the wrong place. There are people all in this world, they know that there's something wrong. Their conscience bears witness against them that they lie and they steal and they malign the name of the God who made them. And they try to make reconciliation and they say things like, you know, this year my New Year's resolution, I'm going to be a better person. Why? Because I recognize that I was a bad person. I want to make things right. You seek reconciliation, but you seek it in the wrong place. Where are these people seeking reconciliation? In idols, in things that are not able to take their sins away from them. They want to sacrifice to Zeus and Hermes. Their high and lofty picture of God is such that when they look at Paul and Barnabas, they say, these must be gods. What a low view of God. They're seeking reconciliation, but they're seeking it in the wrong place. Friends, if reconciliation is to be found, it is through the good news that Jesus Christ, the one who truly is God in the flesh, has come to die for your sins. And you can be made right with God, not because you worked for it, but because you came to the end of your rope and you recognized that Jesus lived the life you couldn't live and he died the death that you deserved. And through him, you can be forgiven of your sins and clothed with righteousness. You can be reconciled, not through the blood of slain oxen. You can be reconciled with God through the blood of the Lamb of God, the one who was slain for you. Look at what Paul and Barnabas do here. Verse 14 through 18. The gospel of God corrects the sinfulness of man. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you and we bring you good news 
that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. What does Paul do here? Paul and Barnabas. The immediate call of the gospel is for them to turn from the idols they are seeking reconciliation through to turn to the living God through whom they can truly be reconciled to him. The call of the gospel is to turn from idols, to turn from looking. See, we're not friends. Don't, don't think that we're far off from these people because we don't worship Zeus and Hermes. Don't think we're far off from them because people in our day, and even we, just like we've studied here in Sunday school, the heart is an idol factory. We don't need Zeus and Hermes to be idolaters. We can worship our checkbooks, our bank accounts. We can worship security in our small towns here in Mid-County. We can worship the perfect family, the perfect picture of what we think a family should be. We can worship all sorts of things as though those will bring us peace and reconciliation. Paul says, turn from these vain things. To whom? To worship the living God. Why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news. They say, because look at what, they, what the people of Lystra have said. The people of Lystra have said, Paul and Barnabas, you are the good news. Paul and Barnabas say, we bring you good news. You've got this mixed up. You say that we are gods in the flesh, but the good news is not that we are gods in the flesh. The good news is that God actually did come in the flesh. And his name's not Paul and Barnabas. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. That's the good news for you people. You can be reconciled through the one who came in the flesh, Jesus. We bring you good news that you should turn from these things to a living God. Notice that the call of the gospel is always to turn from something and turn to someone. You know, Christianity, the Christian religion, is not just a, a, a list of a bunch of no-nos. That's what a lot of people think it is. It's just a bunch of killjoys, bunch, just a list of a bunch of no-nos. You can't do this and you can't do that. When actually the truth is the Bible tells us the things that we can do that give us life. Enjoy the good things of this life. But don't attribute those to, to your own hands or to the things of this world. Enjoy the good things of this life, the Bible says. And when you enjoy them, thank God. Give thanks to God. He's the one who gives you these good things. That's what Paul explains to these people. Look at his explanation here. To the God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. These are the good things he did for you, he says. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. But where did these men of Lystra go wrong? They receive the rains, they receive the foods, they receive all the things that give their hearts a gladness, but they don't give Yahweh glory for it. They give credit to their hands. They give credit to their graven images there in the temple of Zeus, but they don't give glory and honor to God. It's an interesting argument that Paul is making here. To, to these men and women of Lystra. In past generations, please understand this, verse 16, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Now, what on earth does that mean? All the nations is referring to those nations that are not Israel, those who are not the covenant people of Israel, ta ethne, the Gentiles. He says he allowed all the nations to go in their own way. This is what he's referring to because he fleshes it out in the book of Romans. Paul tells us in Romans that God did not give his revealed word to the Gentiles. The Gentiles did their own thing. Those who were not the people of God, they did their own thing. But to the Jews, he gave the prophets. And to the Jews, they are to whom the Christ was born and through whom salvation is given to the world. So he let the Gentiles go about their own way. But Paul's going to go on and say this. 
Don't think for one moment, Gentiles, that you didn't have the word of God, therefore you are not accountable for your sins. Because what, what has God given you? Paul tells them in Romans 1, God has given you the witness of the heavens and the earth, and they declare to you that the eternal God in all of his omnipotent power has made all of these things, and you should worship him. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 20, listen to this argumentation. Paul does it much better than I can. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Even the Gentile who doesn't have the word of God, Paul says, when he looks at creation, he knows that this didn't come about by chance. He knows that this is not accident. He knows God made him. He knows that God made him with a purpose, and he knows he ought to worship God. And he also, furthermore, Paul's going to say, he knows right from wrong because his conscience bears witness against him that he ought not lie, he ought not steal, he ought not defraud his neighbor, and he ought not murder. So his conscience bears witness. Paul says, you Gentiles, you men of Lystra, you know of this God of who I'm speaking of, and now I'm going to tell you his name is Jesus. Jesus is the one who has come in the flesh. Why does Paul fight so hard right here in the city of Lystra? Paul and Barnabas, why do they fight so hard to correct these people's understanding? I think Paul and Barnabas, they surely understand that Satan is trying to turn the people's understanding of what happened. Satan is trying to turn their understanding of what happened and to tell them that, no, God did not do that. Paul and, and Barnabas did. Zeus and Hermes did that. And he's trying to steal away the good gifts of God for himself. And he's trying to take these people of Lystra and take them straight down to hell where he's going. So Paul and Barnabas are going to fight, and they're going to do everything they can. It says they rushed out into the crowd, and literally they started screaming. That word almost has the connotation of screaming, a voiceless cry. You ever scream so loud nothing comes out? That's how loud these men are screaming right here. They have to prevent these people's idolatry, and they have to tell them the truth, that the gospel of God comes to you in your weakness. And God calls you from what? He calls you from idols to worship the living God. Look at verse 18. It says, Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Scarcely restrained the people. But you know what they did? They restrained the people. It was hard. They almost didn't, didn't make it. But they did. And they preserve their gospel testimony. They preserve the testimony of that miracle. Let me ask you a few questions here as we draw to a close. First, how has the power of God confronted you in your weakness? How has the power of God confronted you in your weakness? Secondly, how has the devil or your own flesh, tempted you to worship something or someone other than Jesus? How has the devil or your own flesh tempted you to worship someone or something other than Jesus? Thirdly, what specific idols has God's gospel called you to turn away from in order to follow the living God? What specific idols has God called you to turn away from? Because this text was, yes, written about the men of Lystra, but it's written for our benefit. What idols has God called you to turn from? And fourthly, when you are given credit for something, how quickly do you deflect that credit back to where it truly goes? When you get a raise at work, you might say it's been a while, but when you get a raise at work and people say, Man, how'd you get that raise? What are you tempted to say? 
you know what, I, I, I worked my tail off. That's what I did. I got up every morning and I acted like a man. And I, I took care of my business. That's why I got a raise. What should you say? God has been faithful to me. God has given me the strength. God has given me the ability to be responsible in the things he has done in my life. And I'm going to give credit to God. And I'm not going to attribute the good graces of God to my own doing. Because you know what happens when you do that? You not only become an idolater, you tempt everyone else to become an idolater too. When you ask people to attribute the good graces of God to someone or something other than Jesus. The gospel of God confronts us in our weakness and calls us to turn from idols to worship the living God. Would you pray with me?